Welcome. My name is Louise Davidson Schmink. I'm a professor of political science here at UM. Um, and on behalf of myself and Dr. Marcus Thiel from Florida International University's F uh, EU Center, and um, on behalf of UM's International Studies Graduate Student Association, welcome. This is the third roundtable in a series of five that are going on this academic year that look at issues that the United States and Germany have in common at the outset of the 21st century, challenges that both countries are facing. And the idea of these roundtables is to find out what's going on on both sides of the Atlantic and to see um, what can we learn from each other in the challenges that we face. Um, and this roundtable is not just an isolated event, it's part of over 1,000 events that are going on in all 50 states during this year. Um, as part of the um, Deutschlandjahr, which is, has the slogan Wunderbar Together, which is an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Federation of German Industries, and the Goethe Institute. Um, and the idea is that people all across the United States kind of get um, information about the German-American friendship and the, the concerns and the issues that we all share together. Um, and I think of all the roundtables that we're hosting this year, this one I think is, is really makes so clear why it's important um, that the United States and Germany uh, get along and cooperate together because we're all part of the same planet. Um, and we, at least in the issues of climate change, are facing challenges and whether or not we get along or not, sea levels are going to rise. But if we do get along, it might help us to try to figure out um, what to do about this issue. Um, so tonight we have a lineup of four great speakers to talk to you uh, from, about these issues from the perspective of both sides of the Atlantic. We have here Dr. Philip Stoddard, who is a professor of biological sciences at FIU. He's also the mayor of my hometown, the city of South Miami. Um, and he was a member of President Obama's Governance Coordinating Committee of the National Ocean Council, which was a federal group um, designed to, to think about these issues. Um, and he'll be talking about the science of climate change and the, the problems that it poses um, for the for our planet. Um, and next to him is Catherine Hagman, who is Miami-Dade County's Resilience Program Manager. And she's gonna be talking about what's being done here in Miami-Dade to combat climate change. And if you're a New York Times reader, you'll have heard that um, this is of interest to the entire world and the entire country. And we were written up um, in the, the news um, just this week about our efforts here on this front. Um, and then from the other side of the Atlantic, we have Dr. Marcus Thiel, who is an associate professor at FIU in the Department of Politics and International Relations, the director of the um, EU Jean Monnet Center at FIU, and the director of FIU's European and Eurasian Studies Program. And he's gonna be talking about the European Union's response to climate change. And then our last speaker will be Mr. Axel Zeissig, who's the vice consul from the Federal Republic of Germany. And he'll be focusing on the German efforts um, to combat or to, to adapt to climate change. Um, and each of them will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A from the audience as a whole. And then after that, we'll enjoy some German music and some German food and a chance to get to talk to each other. Um, so without further ado, let me first have Philip Stoddard come up and tell us about the science of climate change. Okay. Yes. So even more important than the Germans and the Americans getting along on this issue is that the Germans and the Dutch get along on this issue. Because uh, the Netherlands is um, mostly at or below sea level, and they're all prepared for sea level rise up to two meters. Um, but they absolutely totally unprepared for anything above two meters, which is a likely outcome, as you'll see in a minute. So I just want to point out this distinguished gentleman uh, to the right of me there, Hal Wanless, who is, um, uh, studies sea level rise through hist ancient history. And he was the first person to really give me lessons on how fast sea level moves. The short answer is uh, quickly for a geologist. Um, but this is a figure that I, I borrowed from my wife, who's writing a book on the history of carbon. She's an architect. Um, and I'll sort of take you through it. And she's got many, many pictures like this with different periods. So this is 100 million years, a little deep history of our planet. 
and there's global sea level, right, right, you know, global sea level, and you can see it bounces around a little bit. And then there's this zigzaggy bit there. That's the glacial periods, interglacial and glacial periods. And then it kind of drops there. Interesting thing, and we'll see more of that. Uh, temperature, you see tracks the sea level, not entirely surprising. Uh, as the temperature is higher, the, the, the polar ice melts, it fills up the oceans, and the oceans go higher. But the interesting one is atmospheric carbon dioxide, which also follows the same general pattern. And we sometimes hear that CO2 makes a blanket over the Earth. That's not correct. Um, it doesn't work like a blanket. What happens is CO2 molecules absorb infrared, which is radiant heat, that would or normally escape into outer space. But when it absorbs it, it re-emits it in a random direction. And some of those random directions are back towards the Earth. Uh, and that's why, that's why every time you add CO2 molecules uh, to the atmosphere, we get more infrared coming back to us. It's just straight physics. And um, it was figured out a long time ago. Now we're going to, um, we've got here uh, Gray's pictures of 10,000 years and 1,000 years. And I put these side by side for a couple things. Let's actually go over here first. So this is the recent, the recent period here. And you can see that the population has gone swooping up extraordinarily. CO2 was pretty flat. And then, boom, it went up. And it's going up precipitously. Sea level rise is just beginning to take off. Temperature is just beginning to take off. But now let's look across 10,000 years. So the span of, of recorded human history is how long? About 6,000 years. Civilization began about 1,000 years before that, civilization as we know it anyway, of living in built structures. And, and look what's happened for this past 7,000 years. The sea level has been almost dead flat. That is to say, humans as a species with our culture have zero experience of sea level rise. The sea level has been going up and down like crazy throughout our history as a species of about a million some years. And when it went down, we ran out following the, following the tides. When it came in, we came in. We came in too. But when we began building things, the sea stayed put. And so we have no culture, no cultural history, no experience, no sense about what to do when the planet starts changing very quickly underneath us. And that is a big cultural problem for us, big social problem for us. Um, so if we just go back over. Um, over, over time here, um, here's, here's the past thousand, 2,000 years. There's the medieval warm period. But what's way more interesting is the little ice age. I used to worry about the ice ages coming back when I was a kid. And so there's been lots of explanations for the little ice age. Now look what's happened recently. Kaboom. But I'm going to come back to the little ice age because it's an instructive story. The best hypothesis for what drove the planet into a cooling period was genocide. We wiped out um, about 56 million people in, in the New World when Europeans came over and brought, and brought things like the common cold and influenza and uh, uh, smallpox, et cetera. And many of those people were farmers. And when they stopped farming, the forests grew back. And when the forests grew back, they soaked up a lot of CO2 and without that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature fell, thus the little ice age. And so there was a tremendous loss of people um, through these areas here. And, and there, was this, this, uh, there was this dip in carbon dioxide actually measured um, at the South Pole. Uh, it's, it's global because, of course, the, the air circulates. Um, temperature is, has, uh, in the last um, 100 and some years, Stayed flat for a while. And then 1929 was the last year it was below the long running average. And it has never come back down again to where it was when our, when our parents were young. Um, and it never will again in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children, grandchildren, or great grandchildren. It's taken off. Um, in fact, the last uh, five years have been the, the warmest on record. Um, the strange thing about this is that the place that sees the most change is the coldest regions, which, of course, is where the ice is locked up. 
And so you, you probably heard a few weeks ago that the, um, that the American Midwest was colder than the North Pole. This is very, very bad um, because of where all the ice is. And you can see the, the reduction in the, in the extent of the Arctic sea ice. Um, you can see here how the, how the sea ice has been declining uh, considerably. Greenland has more melt days than it had before. Uh, you know, way, many, way more melting days than before. And you probably know, and Katie will show you some of the, some of the projections from the uh, International um, um, Panel on Climate Change. Those are based on published data from, that have already gone through peer review. They're retrospective. They're looking back at models that were reconciled with data in the past. Things are changing fast. They're hewing to the upper edge of the models. And here's the scary part. The ice is melting about twice as fast as people had predicted from the ice melt models. And that's, that's disturbing. Um, the implications of that is that, is that the, uh, the ice is likely, the melt is likely to break away from the models. Um, and the models, of course, will get revised as people understand things better. Um, this is the, the speed of ice motion in the Antarctic. Those red areas are where the, the ice shelves and uh, glaciers are moving faster than they, than they, you know, the average. They're really taking off. Um, and, and part of what's causing this, you know, we used to think that those South, those south Polar ice uh, fields were very stable. And they've been moving like crazy and breaking up like crazy. And what's happening is, is the ocean water is getting underneath them. And it's melting it just like, uh, you know, ice in a, in a cool drink. And when it does, it melts in, it gets thinner, the glaciers move faster, and then big chunks break off. And we've seen lots of, of satellite images of this, you know, large, large chunks of ice the size of Rhode Island coming loose. In terms of, of contribution to sea level rise, um, Greenland is, is contributing about twice as much as Antarctica. There's a lot more ice stacked up on Greenland. If you ever get the chance to fly over Greenland during the day, I got diverted once for a hurricane. It was the most, the most amazing visual flight I've ever taken. It even beat the Amazon. East Antarctica is, is um, uh, much more stable than West Antarctica, although recently they've seen some changes in there which aren't on this figure yet. Um, in terms of contribution to sea level rise, it used to be that thermal expansion, you warm things up, they get bigger. Thermal expansion of the seas, just making them warm, they expand and the sea level comes up. That used to be the, um, a bigger piece of the pie than it is now. Um, but you'll see that, that melting, um, which was sort of like, this was the, the d dividing line between um, melt and, and, and non-melt. Uh, the melting is now more than half. It's, it's, taking, it's beginning to dominate the picture and it's gonna continue in that direction with increasing domination. Thermal expansion goes yay so far, but there's lots and lots of ice to melt out there yet. Um, and this comes to, to this paper by Jeff Goodall um, several years ago. Um, and he came down and talked to um, a lot of people, hydrologists and scientists and so forth in, in uh, Miami, engineers, and they kept saying, you gotta go talk to Phil Stoddard. So finally he calls me up. So I, I laid out for him the other half of the story, which is the economics and how this plays out economically. And he said, I've missed half the story. I said, yeah. So he came back down to Miami and he interviewed again as many people and he wrote the second half. He had no word limit. And it's a fascinating, a fascinating piece. The first half really about sort of the hydrology and the second half about people and systems and how we're gonna deal with it. And so if you'd like, I'll take a couple minutes to talk about that before passing it back over to Katie. Um, one of the problems with this globally is that all the communities are pretty much gonna get hit at once. I mean, there's some places now like Miami that are sort of on the edge, um, edge of this, Norfolk, Virginia, um, is actually had it longer and worse than we have. Um, New York City got a, got a big dose of it in a superstorm. But really, it's a whole planet problem. And when it hit, really gets serious, it's going to hit everybody at once. All the coasts of the planet from Shanghai to, to London are going to be dealing with these issues. 
Um, and that really has a, has a big significance. There's not enough money in the world to do the infrastructure we need to do. And the next issue is the people who live inland aren't going to want to pay for the people, give all their money to, to bail out the people on the coasts. They're just not. And, um, you know, so what ultimately happens is that property values necessarily fall at some point. Um, let me just take you back to one, one thing I really should have pointed out in the very beginning. Let's go back to that figure here. Um, I should have pointed this out to you. We're at, at about 415 parts per million. Now we're probably going to 500 parts per million CO2 before we get this under control, if we're lucky, if we work really hard at it. Um, where was the sea level when we last had 500 parts per million CO2? Somewhere around in there. How high is that? Um, that's 120 meters. It was, it was, that's, that's about 50 meters right in there we're looking at. For those of you, you know, I guess most of you think of the metric system reasonably well, but think about a, um, you know, half, half of a soccer field to a full soccer field turned up on edge, and that was the height of the water. And that's why the Dutch have to get along with the Germans. Um, and people in Miami aren't going to be in Miami. It's just not, it's not going to be here. Um, and so you start thinking about, you start thinking about the economics of the situation. You know, it starts off slow and then it gets more extreme. So if it was going to go just up a little bit and stop, we could build our way out of it. Two meters, yeah, we can build for two meters. But it's just getting going when it gets to two meters. It's warming up for three and for four and for six and for twenty. And so you're looking at that exponential rise. And so the investments you make have shorter and shorter returns. And at some point, somebody says, I'm not going to buy coastal properties. I'm moving way inland because I can buy a house inland without having to pay for all of this expensive infrastructure. And I know I can sell my property at some point if I choose to, whereas coastal issues, my costs are going up, the infrastructure costs are going up, and I have that uncertainty. And so the markets eventually go um, very, very low on the coasts. I don't know exactly to zero, but they're going to go very low. And a huge amount of capital is going to be lost. And we have a sort of a, um, an example of the dysfunction in addressing this right now being modeled out for us with the National Flood Insurance Program. So the the private insurers have not been willing to, to do flood insurance in the United States, so it's been left to the feds. It's $20 billion in debt to the American people. And Congress said, this is crazy. People need to pay what their flood insurance is really worth. They need to, to really, the way, this is the way insurance works, is you pay for the risk. And Congress people, particularly from Florida, said, no, 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 don't be so fast. If we do that, if we charge people the actual value of the policies, they can't afford it. And people will lose their homes. And we don't want people to lose their homes, so we're going to continue to provide this national subsidy. Now, that's just flood insurance. You think about losing the actual values of the homes themselves and businesses and the costs of raising roads and everything else and infrastructure. If we can't even solve flood insurance, we got, we got some serious issues. Um, I may be the only politician in the United States who seriously talks about retreat. It's extremely unpopular. But it's, it's not that I want to retreat. I love where I live, and I plan to live there as long as I can. But I also plan for the value of my property to go to zero. It will at some point, possibly when I'm still, uh, still alive to enjoy it. Um, but this is a matter of physics. Matter of geophysics. It's not. It's not a choice. It's not a political issue. It's not that Americans don't want to stand firm against against things. You can't suspend the laws of physics, even if you're Donald Trump. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Katie Hageman. Thank you. Hi, guys. 
I'm Katie. I work for Miami-Dade County. I'm going to just click ahead to my slides. So I work in Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience. So uh, we're a relatively new office. Our office works on both reducing emissions and on the adaptation side. So adapting in Miami means primarily sea level rise. So just to take a step back a little bit about the history of Miami. So much of the land that is within Miami-Dade County used to be underwater as recently as say um, in some places 150 years ago or less. Um, a lot of it was able to be, was part of the, what would be called the Everglades system, but was developed using um, this uh, uh, extensive system of engineering. So the Everglades used to flow historically south through, um, uh, through the Everglades, but it also came through these transverse glades and flooded areas that are presently uh, Miami and other places on the East Coast. So to, to fix that, the, we created an elaborate, this is a, um, an image that shows you kind of where that Everglades used to come very far into areas where, that are developed now. So the flooding obviously was not conducive to the development um, that we wanted to have and the agriculture that we wanted to have. So upon request, the Army Corps of Engineers created an elaborate system of canals, detention ponds, gates, and a water management system that allowed, that brought the water levels down as much as five feet and facilitated the development that happened in, in most of Western Miami-Dade County. So just under present conditions, without those canals, the groundwater would be five feet higher in many places. So much of the areas that you see in red and yellow on the western part of the coast, those would be flooded were it not for the canals. Um, but we've also changed quite a lot on the eastern side of the county, of course. This is a view out of the Miami River. Uh, so with the downtown area on the right and Brickell, or sorry, on the left and Brickell on the south bank on the left. And of course, this is the view that you would see in a place like that today. This is the opposite view, downtown on the right and Brickell on the left. The highest structure is a two-story building. And of course, what we have today is, is this, <laughs> although that's a dated photo and we have many new towers um, in that location. Similarly, looking back from South Beach back to downtown and Brickell in the horizon, you can see the construction of the causeway. What's missing in this photo is our port. Uh, the port is a, is a man-made island. Many of the islands that we live on are man-made. This is a Venetian island and Star Island being constructed. So very recently, much of what is today Miami-Dade County was, was underwater or was wetlands. Stepping back, as Mayor Stoddard already covered in previous ice ages and in, in different climate epochs, we've had the, our areas also been underwater. So during the last ice age, as much of the fresh water was locked up on land, the sea levels were lower. As that ice melts and the fresh water re-enters the oceans, it, it flooded shallow coastal areas like eastern, uh, northeastern Australia. That shallow coastal sea, places that were dry during the glacial time period in the top figure, became flooded and became the foundation for the Great Barrier Reef system. And the Aboriginal communities that still live in Northeast Australia have an oral history of how they moved back from the coast into the interior. And so Florida is also a shallow coastal area. During the ice ages, the coast was much farther, especially on the west coast. But during warm periods, only the orange areas were still above sea. So the, the, the shoreline of Florida was um, way back in central Florida. The ground that we're standing on now was underwater. And you can see the evidence of it throughout the county. This is under the Brickell Metro Mover Station. Our lime stone geology is evidence that the ground that we were standing on was at one time underwater and multiple times. So just by the nature of how and where we've built, um, Miami-Dade County is very vulnerable to flooding, vulnerable to multiple types of flooding. So storm surges that could come with a hurricane from the east, the inland flooding, that freshwater flooding that could come from the west, the heavy rainfalls that come from being in a tropical location. And then also because we have a porous geology underneath us, our groundwater tables change and fluctuate. And so as that rises, it can cause flooding from underneath. So that's this relatively modest amount of sea level 
change that we've seen over the last 100 years, though modest, is very visible because we're so close to sea level and our water system is so fragile. So these king tide photos I took, and this is a UM building, <laughs> so uh, you know none of us are immune. Um, it, it creates a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge, I would say, is that the functioning of that canal system is no longer working as designed. So in some places, there's only a foot and a half of difference between the western areas and the eastern areas where the water was to flow downhill. And so the gravity system, which you see on the left, no longer works during high tide, and so instead they had to construct a forward pump. This is for the watershed around the airport and includes Sweetwater and other places. So that pump comes on and bails the western areas out. So it's pushing the water sideways and uphill. And so this is a technology that can be deployed um, in many, many of our canals that will no longer flow by gravity. But of course, um, you don't need to be an engineer to realize that that's only going to work for a certain amount of time and of course has an energy and an environmental cost. So looking at a map of the topography of Miami-Dade County, the brown areas are the high ground and what was, um, before the water management system was created, what was, what was mostly dry ground. The western areas, which include Kendall, the airport, are shown um, in the lighter colors. That means they're lower lying. And then we have this system of where the water uh, where the water could flow from east to west, these low-lying areas that cut right across the county. And so when we look at what we expect to be impacted from sea level rise, looking just at what we've already locked in with, the, with our um, CO2, with our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we see the blue areas are the areas that are expected to be flooded, even if we were to magically stop emitting uh, today. And, and that's, of course, absent bringing in fill and other things. But as we look at the different futures that are in front of us with climate change, optimistically we could stay at 1.5 degrees Celsius, though we're not on track to do so. Um, but you see the blue areas would be the flooded areas, the white would be dry, and with 2 degrees there is um, very little. Uh, a few, I actually I live on one of the very few areas uh, that is still white uh, up, in, up in Little Haiti. But of course, so this I think more than anything underscores that the fate of Miami is very much tied to globally what happens in terms of emissions, but also that regardless of what happens with emissions, we have to adapt to sea level rise. This is a visualization showing some of the um, things Mary Stoddard talked about before. So it's an animation showing how the mass of Greenland has changed in between 2004 and 2014. So the red areas are places where there's a loss of ice and mass, and the white and blue areas are places where there's accretion or gaining in the interior of the continent. You can see some places. But the green line shows you the overall trend over that decade, and it's down. There's a seasonal gain in the winter, and then a plummet in the summer, and a seasonal gain in the winter and a plummet in the summer. And so as that ice is lost, of course, from Greenland, it affects us right here. So this is just what's happened be um, between those 10 years, and the trend has continued from 2014 to 2018, as it will likely continue uh, for the foreseeable future. So we have uh, projections that we plan to here in the county for all of our projects. We've seen about four inches of rise, though we expect to see a foot perhaps as soon as 2030 or um, further out if we are on a, on a better path. Um, but even short term, regardless of our emissions, we know that we need to accommodate more water within our environment. So we've already seen four inches, and by 2030, we'll see perhaps an additional two in a most optimistic scenario, or more likely an additional 10 uh, by, by 2030. And so at the county, we're trying to integrate this information into how we design our infrastructure. So our projects um, within our office focus on uh, looking at our infrastructure vulnerability. A lot of my work is um, sort of analyzing how different systems, like our roads and our septic systems, will be be affected by sea level rise. But then we also have um, initiatives for planning and how do we plan for um, uh, different communities. Our natural protections I won't be able to talk about in 10 minutes, but they're our best defense against sea level rise. Our mangroves, our, our natural areas help tremendously. And then looking at our economic resilience, um, which is uh, outside of my depth, but we do try and monitor it. If you want to know more about what we're doing on the county, we have a story map that you can go to. It's 
pretty short, and you can scroll through and see the different things that are going on, including what some of the projects are and where you can find them to address flooding or saltwater intrusion, infrastructure vulnerability, and that's a resource on our website. I'm just going to show a couple pictures from a design charrette that we did here at uh, University of Miami with this, in partnership with the School of Architecture. This is a community where the groundwater levels are, basic, are at the surface. Um, Mike knows this area, did the analysis for us, so thank you. And so when the groundwater is so close to the surface, when it rains, there's nowhere for the water to go. There's, um, so it's very challenging to address the flooding. So some of the urban designers looked at how could we incrementally step back from those areas. How can we incrementally better manage the water in those areas? So these images show a sequence over time of how you could take flood prone properties shown in the black there, acquire them, and then create a new water feature in Linear Park and new housing in bright red within the same neighborhood. So not um, necessarily moving to Asheville, but taking that step back um, within, the, within the community and matching the topography. And how that could over time become more of a system that, that recreates um, some of the natural hydrology. This is an image from the city of Miami looking at the Shorecrest area and doing sort of similar concepts of shifting from the vulnerable areas to the higher ground. Around. is a streetscape of what, how we could perhaps have a road diet, lose some of the asphalt and incorporate more water within the city or more vegetation. I'll also mention, though it's not my area, that our office works on reducing sea on emissions as well. So within Miami-Dade County, we emitted about 35 million metric tons, quite a lot. This is our, our trend in emissions. Unfortunately, it's still going up. 2013 is the last year we have the graphics for. But so if you think about acting locally, our emissions are still going up. And you could say, well, that's because we're growing so much. But our per capita emissions are also increasing, largely because we're driving more. So in order to hit our targets, which we have adopted at the county, we need to dramatically reduce our emissions and and you can see the shape of the, um, the arrow there. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we need to get going. These are some ideas that we can uh, implement locally. Uh, and so if you want to advocate for uh, these types of changes, please do so at the local level or reach out to your county commissioners. One of the main programs we have is focused on reducing emissions from buildings. This is our BE305 program. Um, and there's, again, more information on our website. So if you want to stay in the loop, we have a newsletter and also on sea level rise, we're having a series of workshops in April. Um, there'll be uh, the first one is April 4th, um, but we have a couple. So please join us <laughs> and uh, weigh in, and you can stay in touch if you have any questions. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Marcus Thiel from FIU. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, um, Luis, for the invitation. And um, so far, it's been quite interesting slash depressing. Um, I'm not sure I can make it much better or so, but I want to show you. Let me just see. Oh, no, this is going back. Yeah, here. So um, what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to show you a little bit sort of how the whole European context is with regards to uh, climate change adaptation. I think that's the best way we can phrase it nowadays, right, rather than climate change avoidance, obviously. Um, so first I'm going to show you some of the milestones of um, the background and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Europeans together, the European Union with its 28 member states, 27 if or when <laughs> Britain leaves, which is a daily preoccupation of, of mine. Um, so what these countries do, try to do together, in a way. Um, but before I do that, let me just switch quickly here to the public opinion, because public opinion in, in good democracy should inform public policy to a certain extent, right? So if you just look at this as a Pew Research poll from 2015, um, that just looks sort of at the, at the continents. And you can see here, obviously, if we just focus on sort of Germany and Europeans versus Americans, right, that in 20, as latest of 2015, the Europeans, 86% saw climate change as a problem, whereas in the US at the time, only 69% uh, saw that, right? I'm not sure why Latin America has an even high, higher percentage. I don't know, we can debate that maybe later. Now, zooming into Europe, you can also see that with regards to public opinion, there's national variation, right, amongst people. So this is from the Eurobarometer, which is the EU's public opinion instrument. And if you look here, this is from 20, a couple years old. Um, but 
Anyway, you can see here, this is the question that was asked to uh, representative samples is which of the following do you consider to be the single most serious problem facing the world as a whole? So they had several choices, but the darker shaded country, Spain, um, what is this, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, um, and Slovenia, uh, for them this was the number one post and over 23% of citizens said climate change is the single most important problem. And then the lighter the shadings go, the less important the problem was seen. So you see here most of the Central Europeans, uh, yeah, Continental Europeans think it is a problem, between 18 and 22% of those, and then the lighter shaded ones, particularly sort of in the Mediterranean area, I guess, there's a lot of other problems, and so uh, for them it was not quite as pressing. Now going back. So a little bit about the background. Um, it's not only that because the UN's first environmental conference happened to be in Stockholm, the Stockholm UN Environmental Conference in 1972, but also um, it was seen for the European Union as something important already back in the 70s and 80s to act um, on environmental policy. For once, because environmental problems are often transnational, right? From acid rain to nuclear energy fallout to, of course, global warming and sea level rise. But also um, those regulations affect the competitiveness of the single market, of the single European uh, free trade market that the Europeans have built over the years. And you know, if you just think of this very, if you've been to Europe, you know how heavily connected, densely populated that area of the 28 slash 27 is. And so um, if you have a number of these problems, environmental problems that come together, you also endanger literally sort of the, the European and therefore the global economy. So um, based on that, and of course the, the other, there's a couple other points, the Europeans have also understand themselves as true multilateralists. That means they want to create policies together with other nations and don't, usually most of them don't have an extreme sort of sovereigntist or nationalist drive. We can get to that, to that later. That means also that they've been trying to work with the U United Nations. And as the United Nations has developed, for example, their Kyoto Protocol, which was um, in the early 2000s, a signed protocol worldwide by the UN member states, by most of them, I guess, um, to reduce, remember, the CO2 gases, right, by what is it, uh, Mr. Scientist, Phil, um, 8 to 12 percent, I think compared to 1990 levels. So 8 to 12 percent, 8 to 10 percent reduction of CO2 um, by the early 2000s, right? Roughly. Good, thank you. Um, so they adopted this in 2000. Um, now we're talking already much higher numbers in terms of CO2 reduction. Um, in 2004, we had, if you remember and you followed Euro Europe, we had the big bang enlargement. That was when the European Union increased from 15 states to 25 states, now 28, right? Um, those were mostly post-communist countries. Um, and of course, the most post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe were poor and not so affluent. And so what we've seen politically, that of course these things always have to negotiate it. So A, with each enlargement of the European Union, there are more players, and we call this veto players, countries that could raise right, their objections when negotiating multilateral climate change strategies. So that's one thing. But also what we've seen in 2004, that we had these 10 Central and Eastern European countries coming to the negotiation table, and many of them just basically had the position that, no, we just don't have the money that it costs to protect the environment. We cannot build these you know, high-tech filters right, um, in our companies or our state-owned uh, electricity um, uh, companies. And so now what we've seen after 2004 is that there has been a little bit of a split between the more affluent Scandinavian countries that are, and you know, like the more richer countries in general in the European Union, which are supposed to be greener, who can afford to be green, and the lesser, the poorer ones with a stronger focus on economic growth. Then moving on, in 2005, the Europeans came up with the idea of the Emissions Trading Scheme, or ETS, and um, that has spread out, as far as I understand, for our scientists, they can probably confirm that um, a little bit. Um, but it was pretty much groundbreaking, from what I understand. And the emissions trading scheme in Europe was a scheme in which the European Union tried to use market forces to limit and eventually reduce CO2 emissions. So basically, each member state got a certain number of emissions allowances. That was sort of the cap and trade system, right? And then, of course, the private companies could get these. And if some certain private companies were able to um, emit less, they could sell 
the leftover emissions rights to companies or states that would need that because they were not so green. So that was an incentive for companies, uh, the private sector, to kind of become greener. Not sure it has worked so much. If I, that's why I put the plus and minus. A, I guess a great idea, but in practice, it didn't work as well as we thought so. Particularly because what happened, if you remember, after 20, 2008, the great, what was the great regression or the great recession that we had, um, certain many countries, even in Europe, were not quite economically as productive. And that meant they didn't have the needs for a lot of these emissions allowances because there were fewer cars, fewer trucks driving, fewer companies emitting greenhouse gases. So that's something that still needs to be, I think, um, revamped, and they've tried to do this continuously. In 2008, we had, uh, that's very important, the adoption of the 202020 goals by the European Union. And as I said, by the year 2020, in next year, actually, um, the EU member states committed themselves to use less, 20% less energy, to build up, at least on national level, 20% uh, renewable energies within their energy mix, and to emit 20% less CO2. Now, um, the interesting thing, however, is that um, this is a goal that's overall for all the 28 slash 27 member states. So, um, the, and for the European Union, it's important to achieve that together. And you can imagine, again, going back to the disparities between some states, right? Not all the states achieve that. Thank you so much. I promise I'm not going to ask. Um, so, I think by now, one year before, about 15 of the 28 have achieved the 2020 goal. But that still leaves us with about 10 or more that have not yet achieved that, right? But the EU sometimes makes sort of magic um, appear these numbers to be working because they can average it out or can take the sum of all of them together, right? And um, politically, we've seen that also an increased drive because um, the European Commission, the EU's executive, after 2010, created a separate directorate general or basically a high-level <coughs> cabinet post for climate action. That's in addition to the directorate general on environmental policy that we have. That shows you that two directorates, right, that's already quite a bit. Um, that means a political push in Brussels. Of course, we had the impact of the economic crisis, less um, emissions, but also less money to work on um, climate change adaptation. Now, we are there today. What I wanted to show you, oops, sorry, yeah, here. Um, what I want to show you here, I didn't want to give you a sort of an EU table because they're quite hard, quite difficult to read. So this is the Climate Change Performance Index of uh, 2019, as you can see here. The Climate Change Performance Index is a uh, conglomerate, is produced by a conglomerate of three NGOs, two of them German. Um, and these NGOs, together with experts and scientists, rate the climate change performance of the various countries. Now, if you just look globally, you can see just focusing in on, on, on the US and Germany, right? The US is in very low, of course, and Germany is in yellow here under medium. And here you have the little area um, of Europe, and you can see the national, again, the national variations with the rating. Um, none of the countries globally, by the way, or in Europe, achieved the very high rating of being sort of really the best ones, the top performers, trying to avoid climate change, right? Now, let's look at some of the country data. Here, I'm not sure you can see this, but um, so none of the green ones, the best, there's, there is basically really no best performers, they say. The best one is, uh, as of 2017, is France, followed by Sweden, the United Kingdom, Cyprus, Morocco, Luxembourg, and Malta rounds at the number 10. Um, I just checked the current numbers from 2019, because this is 2017. Um, Sweden moved actually up, and Sweden is the best European performer. Um, Germany uh, is here in 2017 on number 29, so in the medium category. It moved up a few places last year, but it has moved down to number 29 again as of this year. Um, now, can you find the US? It's number 43 on the right-hand side in the lower middle camp, sort of below Thailand, but before, above Malaysia, right? Um, that's number 43, remember that. Um, as of 2019, uh, the US is, has been on the bottom, number 59 out of 60. 
or 60 out of 61. Saudi Arabia is still remaining on top. Kind of makes sense, right? That's Saudi Arabia. So you can see here, just because we're talking here about transatlantic relations, you can see the differences also in sort of policy importance. And I'm sure you probably are aware that the Trump administration basically removed themselves from the Paris, the UN's Paris Agreement, which that removal will only take come into effect, by the way, in 2020. Hopefully after, you know, he is gone. So this is the, there's something, <laughs> but without getting too much into detail. Um, now, how do they rate? How do they rate this here? Um, we have um, each country is rated by the current emissions level. That's the dark blue column. The development of emissions, contemporary and going forward. The share of renewable energies, and you can see here some countries have a higher share or more points for more renewables. Um, the efficiency in use and climate policy. That is. Um, their development, national development of climate change plans. Now, so that's where we are pretty much close. We're getting close to today. Um, I mentioned already the Paris Climate Agreement, the UN's Paris Climate Agreement, um, where the Europeans are very much one of the, the, the vanguards of that and promoters of that, thank God. And um, each member state, therefore, in the European Union that's going on right now this year is required to develop a national energy and climate plan. I don't know if we're going to talk a little bit more about this um, to make sure that actually these goals are going to be implemented and then the progress is reviewed every two years. In 2014, we already kind of skipped the 2020-20 goals and now we're looking at 2030. In fact, we're looking at 2050, but let's talk first about the 2030 climate and energy framework. The European Union um, has committed themselves to cut 40% of greenhouse gas emissions compared to the 20% before. 20% uh, share of renewable energies and a 27% improvement in energy consumption, right? And right now there is a lot of debate going on on the EU level about sort of can we achieve this and can we possibly top that? And um, just to give you an idea, because we're talking here about transatlantic relations, um, the 27% share of renewable energies, the European Parliament, the legislature of, of, of Europe or the European Union, um, has um, suggested, the European parliamentarians have suggested, to go over 30% of an energy mix by 2030. Right? Um, some countries, particularly Denmark, Sweden, Spain, want to go up to 35%. Uh, the German energy minister just recently kind of, kind of threatened to veto that and said, like, we have to have realistic goals, um, otherwise, you know, our citizens won't make that, uh, won't go with us. Now, um, that could be true if you particularly think of sort of what Emmanuel Macron, President Macron in France, right, the protests that he had, that he experienced after he tried to introduce that sort of ecological tax um, for consumers. But on the other hand, I think it has also to do with the heavy uh, automotive and transport and logistics industry of Germany. Good, and then so if we move then in 2018, the EU actually declared to want to be energy neutral by 2015. That means sort of the consumption of energy overall that we have should be offset by various strategies that you would know much more about, um, carbon storage, right, reforestation, and other means to kind of basically not increase CO2 emissions. Um, and that is also something that is right now heavily debated. And again, we see the more Scandinavian uh, countries pushing ahead to try to achieve the energy neutrality, but also the Scandinavians, if you know, they have a, a lesser population. Some of their uh, technologies or their economies are not quite as industry dependent as other countries. So um, they can afford to push right, forward with that. Whereas then we need to take care that we also drag along the laggards. Um, other trends nowadays, aside from that lofty goal to be energy neutral by 2015, is to use climate change or to see climate change on an EU level as a security issue. Just think of issues such as the retreat from water, the, the migrant waves, right? If the Sahara keeps on getting hotter, the migrant waves that you, the Europeans may have to face, water wars that we will increasingly see over the next couple of years. And um, there has been also, a, in terms of transatlantic relations, a proposal floating around about a carbon tax for producers from outside the EU market that do not sign up to the Paris UN Paris Agreement, which would of course heavily affect the United States as well, should that be implemented. But as in EU, you know, in the EU can always um, not be implemented as well. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you Marcus.
And last but certainly not least, we have Axel Zeissig from the German consulate. Yes, um, let me start first um, just um, a few words. Why do Germany engage in, in climate policy? We feel also, like um, uh, other countries, that we have a responsibility towards climate. Germany is one of the largest economies in, in the world. And our estimated contribution to, um, to global warming since the beginning of industrialization was 5%. Um, our yearly emissions of greenhouse gas per capita is twice the international average. And extreme weather events such as flooding uh, doubled in the last 50 years in Germany. So we have a huge problem with that too. And the IPCC warns that if uh, global warming reaches more than two uh, degrees Celsius until 2100, this will have a significant negative impact. And if we don't limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions, studies uh, suggest that uh, this temperature will even raise uh, up to four degrees Celsius. Um, so I would like to, to speak a little bit about our goals and where we are today, and also speak a little bit about what uh, Marco said, that we are now classified in the middle um, of this ranking um, and the reasons for it and what we are planning for the future. Um, Germany is committed um, on climate goals um, and national uh, strategies, as well as in European and international um, level. Uh, especially those defined by the Paris Agreement. Our, probably you heard about the Energiewende, which is the energy transition. It plays a major role in the strategy of Germany to um, lower the, the greenhouse gas emissions. It is about restructuring our energy provisions towards renewable energies and also combine them with uh, measures of energy efficiency. Um, a few short facts on that. Um, we have right now in Germany, one third of the consumed electricity came from renewables in 2017, um, in comparison to 6% in, in, in 2000. So this, is, this was quite a, a development. Since 2017, Germany also um, improved the cost efficiency of, of, um, of the electricity and of this transition, because um, the subsidies that we had before were managed by a feed-in tariff. So everybody producing energy got uh, the right to a uh, fixed remuneration for their um, electricity. And now um, it is determined uh, by bidding rounds. So we were able to stop the price dynamics um, in, in 2017 so that the electricity prices at least remained the same as in 2016 because Germany has particularly high prices for electricity. Um, although nuclear energy uh, is already gradually being phased out until 2022, our energy provision is, is stable. And we're aware that more needs to be done, especially with regards to reducing our overall energy consumption. And it is also crucial for us to develop our grids uh, with regards to renewable energies because we have uh, energy production a lot of energy production uh, with uh, wind energy in the north, but our industry uh, who needs this, uh, this energy is located more in the south or in the west part of the country. The current energy mix in Germany consists also one third renewables, and then we have still one third coal. Um, we have 22% of lignite, which is quite harmful for the environment, 14% hard coal, and followed by 13% gas. Most of uh, Germany renewables energy uh, comes from, uh, as, as I said, it's, it's wind energy, uh, not photovoltaics. Um, if somebody has been to Germany uh, between October and April, probably he understands why. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, uh, we have our climate agenda. It's uh, the Climate Action Plan 2050, so it's aligned, of course, with the, with the European um, policy too. And it contains our strategy to achieve the climate goals uh, in accordance with the Paris Agreement uh, for different sectors, such as energy industry, also building efficiency is important, and uh, mobility. The key targets that we have uh, on a national level 
are that greenhouse gas emissions should be reduced by more than, than half, uh, always in comparison to 1990 uh, until 2030, and by 70% until 2040. And at the end, then, Germany should become uh, or reduce the, the emissions by 80 or 95%, between 80 and 95% until 2050. The Climate Action Plan, and this is one of the most important debates that we had uh, recently um, in, in policy, is that the Climate Action Plan also contains uh, a number for 2020, which is next year. And uh, it was um, predicted that we should attain 40% uh, of reduction of emissions. And right now, it is uh, predicted that we will fall short of this uh, target by 8%. And um, according to a recent study, in 2017, Germany was reducing, I would say, 28%. So now, of course, um, the political debate is, was, was really focused on how we can reduce this shortfall uh, to, for 2020. And uh, last year, the government um, introduced a, a commission, uh, which is widely referred to as the Coal Commission, Kohle Commission. And they were appointed to propose a strategy or measures to achieve those uh, middle and long-term goals. And the central question, of course, was how to reduce the impact of the energy sector in, in Germany, which is responsible for uh, half of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And also, the commission was um, uh, should uh, develop an exit strategy for um, coal including uh, a binding exit date and all the economic measures that need to be combined with uh, such, an, such a decision. Um, it is important to know the Commission is not um, able to take a political decision on their own, but they're giving a recommendation. Um, it is, however, a key contribution to Germany's future um, climate and uh, energy policy. Uh, because it was elaborated with a joint negotiation with different stakeholders of the industry and also with members of the governing parties. And the results were published only a few weeks ago. And the, the propositions were Germany should phase out uh, the coal completely until uh, 2038 and also start to gradually reduce the capacity of coal-fired power stations by... Um, 2022, already 25% reduction, and including a, a significant portion of lignite because it's the most harmful uh, way to produce energy um, that we have in our energy mix. And then by 2030, additional capacity should be taken from the grid until 2038, where it's uh, going to be phased out completely. Um, this has a lot of impact, of course, uh, on an industry um, in, in, in Germany. Uh, so the Coal Commission also proposed to compensate uh, operators of coal-fired power plants um, for all those uh, power stations that are going to be uh, taken from the grid by 2030. And also compensate private households, enterprises and the industry for rising energy prices. So it is very important that, um, or a political decision, that private households should not take the burden of, of higher prices because we had already energy transition towards renewable energy and phasing out um, nuclear energy, which had a significant impact on energy prices in Germany. Now, this was a very tough question, too. It's because we have some federal states in Germany that are producing coal, such as Nordrhein-Westfalen, or the state of Brandenburg, Sachsen-Anhalt, we have different states, and they should be entitled to structural help. Um, it will amount of up to 40 billion euro until uh, 2040, and the idea is to create new jobs there, to um, invest in infrastructure projects, and also to give investment incentives for companies. Um, of course, also supporting coal workers, um, elderly employees uh, should be compensated for their lost wages and also for less uh, pensions in the future. And younger uh, coal workers should undergo uh, a certain training. The uh, coal phase out should be also monitored very strictly because um, 
uh, just to ensure that uh, the energy provision is still reliable. And um, we would like to go also not only on renewable energies, but also on, on gas-fired power station because they're better for the emissions too. So they should also uh, be granted expedited permissions and incentives also for investors. And in addition, Germany is planning uh, also um, bidding rounds or more bidding rounds for, uh, to increase the share of renewables in our energy mix. The target now is uh, to achieve 65% until uh, 2030. We will also have this year a formal law that will come in, uh, into, into force, the Climate Protection Act, which will provide an enforceable foundation for the, for the targets that we have in our climate agenda 2050. And we hope that the combination of all those uh, measures uh, should, be, uh, should enable us to, to attain the goals for, that we have set for 2030. So to resume the policy, we can say that we're in an ongoing political debate now on how to close the gap that we have for the goals for 2030, and no, for 2020, that's the gap, and which measures and mechanisms are best suitable to reach the goals 10 years later. And in this context, the Coal Commission uh, gave uh, quite important answers on, um, yeah, for example, that they delivered a concrete date on when we should uh, phasing out uh, coal and um, all the uh, extensive structural changes that this decision brings with it. And they were very, they were being discussed with a lot of emotions, of course, and very intensively across all the different uh, stake or um, all the different interests that are held in this sector. Um, and one good result for us is now that we have this report from the Coal Commission and the recommendations that are uh, uh, compromised between those stakeholders. Um, as I said, in 2019, the, the climate target will be introduced uh, into the, the Climate Protection Act, uh, a formal law, which will um, allow enforcing us this climate protection and attaining the goals for 2030. And in the, in, the, in the meantime, the renewables are being extended with new bidding rounds, as I said, and, and more uh, measures such as uh, energy and efficiency, sustainable mobility. And um, yeah, and resu uh, resuming, I would say that the Paris Agreement remains um, our, our top priority to keep the global warming uh, if possible, uh, at 1.5 degrees Celsius, and um, but definitely below 2 degrees, and that we aim to be 80 to 95 percent emission-free in comparison to 1990 until um, the the second half of the of this century. Thank you very much. You. And I'd like it if I could. If I could get my two panelists back here, let's take two or three audience questions before we go um, over to having some refreshments and some relaxation, and I'll take your question first. If you could identify yourself, that would be great. Uh, Mike Sukop uh, from FIU. I wanted to ask about France, why it comes out so good. I think it might be due to nuclear energy, and you know that's kind of, I'm a little uncomfortable with that personally sometimes, so I don't know. Just your comments, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, th thanks, Mike, uh, also for coming. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that exactly nuclear energy has a lot to do with it, right? France relies heavily on nuclear energy, and their renewable mix is actually also way below the 2020 threshold. Uh, the re so so there, they just, similar to the German uh, attempt to have the coal commission, because coal is a, a big... Um, heavy hitter in, in, um, against environmental policy in Germany. The French also have had a similar policy process in these days, particularly after these uh, Yellow Vest protests that were related to the potential introduction of that fuel, that ecological tax that Macron, President Macron wanted to introduce. Um, and so they already s said that um, they want to increase their share of renewables. But from what I've read, there was not much being said about a reduction of nuclear energy. I don't know if you have something to add with it, because as you know, I mean, once nuclear energy is so heavily established in the country, it's hard to... Yeah. Very, very briefly, there's, there's one thing that I had in my notes that I didn't talk about, but it, it dovetails with what you both spoke of, and that is that before the U.S. Congress at this point, the House of Representatives, but not yet the Senate, 
is something called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, House Resolution uh, 763. And the idea is very different from what Macron attempted to do. It taxes carbon, but it returns it directly to the people. In fact, they're talking about beginning the dividend even before the tax comes into place, so people begin getting money in. And if Macron had done that, re started returning money directly to the, to the populace, I think he could have spared himself and his country a lot of the grief. Um. My name is Volker Anding, a retired German diplomat. Um, I have a brief comment to Dr. Stoddard. It's alarming uh, uh, presentation. I just had two weeks ago the visit of a, one of the leading German politicians who is an environmental expert, and we had a briefing by Professor Hal Wenless, but and now comes the important part. We also had a briefing at the Downtown Development Authority of the city of Miami. <clears throat> and of course we asked them, as this is ground zero for sea level rise problems, what the Downtown Development Authority of Miami does about this. And they said nothing. Because the board of directors is composed exclusively of real estate developers. And they are not interested, they do not discuss this problem. And so I would highly recommend to contact the Downtown Development Authority of Miami and maybe convince them with your very uh, impressive numbers because I think it's a scandal that they develop like crazy, you know, what goes on in Downtown Miami, billion dollar investments, amortization in 50, 60 years, and after us, the, the flood. Um, so I think we, locally we should really start here. Well, of course, D.C. is un difficult, more difficult, but we should do something here when the board of directors says yeah. doesn't concern well, us. Now, it, it's, it's a little more interesting than that because they, um, they actually are doing something. They just don't want to talk about it. And one of the things that they're beginning to do in local development is for large buildings, the ground floor goes up 20 feet, so six and a little bit meters. And the reason is they know they're going to have to raise that floor up in time. And so they're building that into the designs now. So they don't want to talk about it. But if you go and talk to the architects and understand the rationales for some of the decisions they're making, you'll discover they're beginning to, to actually build for it. Um, I'll, I'll add also. Am, am, I, am, I, am I correct on yeah, that? Yeah, you're thing? correct. Yeah. yeah, I'll add also, though, your main point is essential that um, just today I got a call from one of our largest developers downtown. Uh, what are you guys doing? <laughs> so, so they are, so they, they, we do, we do get um, uh, inquiries, but as Mayor Stoddard said, only some of our development community feels comfortable being vocal about it, and many have an opposite approach. But these are the new buildings. What about the existing buildings? Your that, point is very valid. They're not built, you're correct, they're not built for it. The other thing that's sort of funny that happens is they'll corner me in an elevator, you know, and the doors close. <laughs> they'll say, is all that stuff really happening? Is that really true? I said, yeah, unfortunately it is. I said, oh, I was hoping it wasn't. Thanks. <laughs> 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 so hope springs eternal. Do we have another question before we wrap up? Uh -huh. Uh, thank you very much. It was very, very informative, even if depressing. But I have a, a really a very, very basic question, and I think you are so um, qualified to answer that. How do you exactly measure CO2 emissions for an entire country? I mean, it, this to me a little bit is like a fiction because you know you have all those emitters, and then you have all the mechanisms that um, sort of absorb and so forth. So how can and then of course you have you know I don't think the emissions stay in a, within borders and so forth. So how do you actually measure them? I can just add that at, for the county, we have one full-time staff member that measures our emissions, and uh, it, it's a very technical, but yeah, it's, uh, there, there are methods that are, and there are also standards for, you know, uh, starting, let's say, with a smaller scope of measuring direct emissions and then building out to be more complex and, say, measuring things like your consumption. And um, so, and there are platforms, softwares, and guidance on how, how to do that as well. So there's sort of two, sort of two big methods. There's there's the spreadsheet where you try to account for everything that you can that you can you know is putting out carbon dioxide, and then there's actual measurements using something called eddy flux towers. And there's whole networks of these across the planet where they measure what's really moving. And so it's not just what we emit through our activities, but also what the soil releases, what 
what plants release, um, what microbes release. Um, there's a lot of a lot of flux of carbon. Um, what's coming up, up out of out of uh, store, you know, soil stores of carbon. Um, warming the planet, we start changing that carbon flux pretty dramatically, and it could even swamp the amount of carbon that we're producing ourselves. There are some animations as well put out by NASA where you can see that, that flux seasonally and around the globe, and it's sure. quite beautiful. And I, just from the EU level, I, that's actually been one of the hot topics over the past two years or so, uh, trying to define exactly um, sort of what do we measure, right, when we try to benchmark states against each other. And um, I guess um, you would know probably better about it, but from what I understood is that sort of, um, you know, international aviation and maritime trade is some of the most difficult ones to measure, precisely because they're boundary <coughs> crossing, right? You know, it's harder. And I've been very, aviation is increasing, if I may say. The yeah, hardest yeah, yeah, yeah. thing is actually solid waste. And this is one of the reasons I have not been big on, you know, until recently, in even getting a, a carbon footprint for my city, because I cannot get Miami-Dade County to give me solid waste figures, and they run the landfills. And so you've got... I can't get them either. It makes me feel better. Yeah, they don't <laughs> exist. They don't exist. I, you know, I talk, to your, I talk to your boss, and they just do not exist. Nobody has estimated... Um, landfill carbon, and and it's a particular problem because some of that comes off as methane, which is um, orders of magnitude more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But there's some good news, <laughs> and and the good news is that in the United States at this point, it is possible to go net zero. With your, with your house and your car, and I've done it. Um, and so that our house now produces enough solar power that it runs the entire house and the car. And, and our car. Ah, now this, that, 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 that's, that's, that's a, a, a separate topic. I've got wonderful next door neighbors, and they, they got an electric car too, which they occasionally come over and charge in, on, in, in our house. And they're welcome to do so because they actually gave us a charger, which is very nice of them. But it does blow my carbon budget, so I'm going to have to put on more panels to, to be able to charge my neighbor's car. Uh, but the point being is you can actually do this. We now have a battery, so one of the things I'm going to do during spring break is I'm going to turn off the FPL power entirely. And I'm going to keep it off for a week, and I'm going to blog on it. I've got the Sierra Club that's going to run it, probably um, a couple of other organizations. And we're going, to, we're going to do this during spring break, and we're going to try it again during the hurricane season. But I believe it's now, it's now possible to do that with your domestic power. The problem comes if you fly anywhere. It totally screw up your carbon, your carbon footprint for the year. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that one. So I guess we'll have to. I buy, car I buy carbon offsets. I'm not 100% convinced that, that, uh, that they're real. Can I add one other positive note? I would say if you're a resident of Miami-Dade County, many of our elected officials are also very responsive on this topic. So if you can add your voice to, um, to the issue, I think they'll, you'll, you'll have, um, uh, you can have a, a great impact locally. And, and one more thing. You save money by doing this. If you get solar on your house, if you have a sunny roof, you get about 14% internal rate of return with today's federal tax credit. It's the only good tax credit we've got right now. And on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. at the South Miami uh, Recreation Center, the Bethel Gibson Community Center, we have uh, a, the solar co-op information session. So if you want to find out how to get solar for your house at a really good price, come at 10, come at 10 uh, to our community center and, and find out. Super. Thank you very much. So the next part of our program is going to feature some Beethoven music played by some UM um, undergraduates from the Frost School of Music, and then we will all have refreshments. But before we do that, I have a couple of announcements. The first thing is, because I'm a professor, I want to test you and find out what you've learned tonight. So everyone has a little comment card, and I would be greatly appreciative if you could write on your comment card one new thing that you learned tonight. We promised the German Federal Foreign Office that we're going to be teaching people new things. And so now we need the proof that you learned something. So before you leave, if you'd fill out your comment card and put it, there's a little box on the table over there. That would be very helpful. 
Um, and back there on that table, we have information about a number of different um, German-American groups um, and some information about other programs that are being offered through the Deutschlandjahr, including you can pick up a card, you can access 50 different German movies online and watch them this year. Um, and there's information about how to do that over there. The other thing that I would like to do is to invite you to the next round table in our series. It will be at FIU on March 21st, um, also a Thursday night at 7 p.m. and we're going to be talking about some economic challenges that the both countries face um, including how to develop a competitive workforce for the 21st century and among other panelists we'll have um, a German author Isabel Kirchner who's the author of a book called The New Work talking about the workforce of the 21st century um, and if you missed our previous roundtables on changing gender and sexuality norms and on immigration, they're now available to watch online and you're welcome to access those or share the videos with your friends if they miss them. Um, and so without further ado, let's go enjoy our German food and drink. This is a, a, an event about German-American friendship, so talk to a German or an American that you don't know and meet somebody new tonight. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much to our panelists.